my first my very first photography class was with Joe Cameron, who was here. And I got to tell you, Joe, it was you who sort of lit that fire and made me just take off with this. And I, I fondly, fondly remember that first class with you. So I just, I had to say that. Um, so we're here to talk about 2020 Unmasked. This is uh, our self-published book that um, our documentary photography book that we published this past September. And we are now um, about to enter our third printing. We are um, just about, I think we may have three or four books left from this past printing and we're gonna be taking orders for the next one. Um, 2020 Unmasked has been accepted into the Library of Congress, into their permanent collection, as well as in the, uh, the, li the National Library of Scotland, which we're very proud about. And we've won two honorable mention, honorable mention awards that Ari will be talking about later for, um, for, uh, for the book. So I am a local street photographer. Um, I'm also the photographer for NBC here in Washington, DC, and uh, a longtime TV producer. That's how I've been putting food on the table. Um, and I'm so grateful to be a member of this award-winning team. So how did we meet? About eight years or so ago, we um, were all on traveling workshops, photography workshops, with um, hosted by Ari and other National Geographic photographers, two of which Joe McNally and Ira Block um, are appear in our book. Joe McNally wrote the introduction and Ira Block, we're very happy to say, wrote the final comments, the final notes. So around March of 2020, um, Unbeknownst to each of us, I in Washington, Susan in Boston, and Victor in New York, we were all out shooting the pandemic and the lockdown. And uh, we kind of discovered on Instagram that we were all doing this. And we decided, hmm, why don't we put something together? Uh, a book about, or do something about the three cities. At first we thought maybe we'd do a, a gallery show or something. And then we landed on a book and um, we needed someone super creative and very <laughs> organized to handle this. So we asked Ari Bay if he would be our book editor and lead designer with Danielle Hernandez, who was actually from Davenport, Davenport, Iowa. So we came from all different directions, all of us. We had given Ari literally thousands, thousands of photographs to work with. And we worked for um, about 80 or so consecutive weeks meeting every Sunday for about two, two and a half hours, going through our photos and discussing what we needed to do. And Ari will go into more of that later. So I'm going to need to get to my first photograph here. So I'm going to share my screen. Bear with me. Uh, whoops, I was afraid this was happening. Uh, let's see. I'm sharing the screen. And OK, don't look, anybody. Here we go. <laughs> OK, so this is the title and logo of our book. We are three photographers, three cities, one year like no other. That's me. This was the first photograph that I took during lockdown uh, at the Washington Monument. Um, what kind of struck me about this was that the reflecting pool was completely empty and vacant. And to me, it spoke to the emptiness um, <clears throat> and the diminished life around us. This was at a playground. I would just go out and drive around and see what was there. And I, I came upon this playground and um, I really got 
emotional, got tears in my eyes when I saw this, seeing that caution tape, preventing children from going in and playing and just wondering what life was going to be like for them. So this is a rare sight, the Supreme Court now without any barriers around it. Um, now they're usually metal gates and a strong police presence. Um, I asked this Capitol Hill police officer if I could take his photograph and he said to me, well, let's put it this way. I'll just look the other way and you do what you wanna do. So snap, I grabbed him. Mm -hmm. This uh, to me really exemplifies sort of the sad reality of, uh, of these times in particular, because the only people on the streets really were, were homeless people. And the only sound and soundtrack of the streets were sirens and birds. I drove past this site a bunch of times and um, offered food to this lady. This is June 2nd. This was the first massive gathering to protest the killing of George Floyd. And uh, in the upper right, you can see this is 8th Street, um, looking pretty much as far as the eye can see. To the left is the, is the White House. Um, there were thousands and thousands of people there, and they were chanting, say his name, George Floyd, say his name, George Floyd. It was very, very emotional, um, giant uh chant by this huge crowd i turned around and i saw this woman and this young woman and i felt really uncomfortable taking her photograph because of the grief that she was in and experiencing but i i just knew it would be an important an important image and i i really wanted to um I really wanted to show it. Her sign echoes what so many were feeling, tired, exhausted, and spent. This was Juneteenth on Black Lives Matter Plaza, the area designated to uh, permanently commemorate the movement. And that day there was music and dancing and food and all sorts of great things going on. Um, and I happened to see this artist who was walking around and painting or drawing chalk lines around people as his statement, um, honoring those who had died at the hands of police. Data by the Washington Post shows that black Americans are killed by police at twice the rate of white Americans. This was uh, Trump supporters at the Capitol on July 4th. Uh, I sort of wandered through them and around them and they were kind of curious about me. Um, and as I got closer, one of them asked if I was a, a hippie journalist. So uh, I just kept smiling and just snapping pictures. Um, the okay hand sign, hand gesture rather, has been used as a power as a symbol of white power since 2017. On the steps of the Supreme Court, hundreds and hundreds of people gathered well into the night for a, a memorial for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. This is October 17th, the Women's March with women dressed as handmaids passing by the Trump Hotel on Pennsylvania Avenue. On December 12th, the Million MAGA March came into town two days before the Electoral College was to formally elect Biden. The location of this photo was taken at Black Lives Matter Plaza, which was actually blocked off by police. Uh, Trump supporters wanted desperately to get into the plaza and deface it. There was all sorts of chatter 
on Parler and other social media platforms that I was following where they described what they were going to try to do to it. And here I'm inside the police line and this guy's not too happy about it because he can't get in. This was that same night, which turned very violent on K Street around the city. Here an explosion was set off. And shortly after that, a police line uh, was established to separate the Trump supporters from the anti-Trump folks. So behind me are all the anti-Trump folks and behind the police line are all the Trump supporters. It was a rather tense moment. <laughs> to say the least. It was also, I have to add, right around the corner from there, um, at some time during these hours, I had to go to the bathroom really badly. And um, one of the, I guess you'd call them Antifa people, showed me where I could go in front of a hotel where some bushes were. <laughs> Here I am, 60-ish year old woman doing this. Um, you do what you got to do when you're out in the streets. What can I say? This was October 5th. Trump was hospitalized at Walter Reed Hospital for COVID. And um, so opposite the hospital, there were all the media, uh, camera crews, TV crews, everybody. And um, there were Trump supporters that were riding up and down the streets in their trucks and um, yelling support for, for Trump, wishing him well, and um, honking their, they're very, really noisy. It was quite a spectacle. And so behind me were the media and I was actually trying to take a picture of them. And all of a sudden I heard this car or somebody screaming and, and I had to turn around and I whipped around and Capture, and I just had my shutter down on my camera and, I, and, and caught this. I didn't realize it till I went back home. And I was just grateful that my toes weren't run off because run over because um, their truck was that close to me. This was at the Supreme Court. It was uh, the confirmation rally of Amy Coney Barrett. And I, I saw this guy and I was kind of stunned by his t-shirt. Um, I was really baffled by it. And I just asked him if I could take his photograph. And he said, sure. And he started posing for me. I found out later that this is Enrique Tario. He is the leader of the Proud Boys, who was sentenced in August to five, month, five months in prison for, um, for weapons and vandalism charges and setting fire to a banner at a church in DC. He's, uh, I believe he was just recently let out of jail. This is a most special person to me. This is Nadine Seiler. I spent a lot of time with Nadine and Karen Irwin at the Black Lives Matter Memorial fence. This was the, um, the fence that Trump put up to block people from the White House. And it became a place for people to put up all sorts of, of protest signs about many things, uh, primarily about police brutality. It had become a, a real target um, of white supremacists who wanted nothing more than to just rip all the signs down. And to prevent that, Nadine and Karen slept at this fence for four months. They slept outside 24 seven to protect it. Um, today, they are trying to find uh, permanent locations for the more than 700 plus artifacts that grace the fence. Some of them are now at the Library of Congress, some are with Howard University, but there's a lot that um, they're hoping will find permanent homes. These are unsung heroes, I believe, <laughs> uh, in my mind. They are the workers at the DC Medical Examiner's Office um, the DC morgue. It took me months and months and months to get approval to get in. Um, they wanted they wanted to be positioned around this table that they use to transport bodies. Um, they're the nicest people on the planet. <laughs> um, I asked them, you know, why they wanted to take a picture by this 
table and they said, well, this is where we usually have lunch. <laughs> I thought that was quite humorous. This is Pete Kana. He is um, a high school teacher. And this photo was taken seven months to the day since his last day in class. He was really overwhelmed when he went in, um, overwhelmed with emotion, seeing the desks and the untouched papers. So the levels of food security skyrocketed and I went to a food distribution site on 16th Street in DC. Um, at 9 a.m. people would start to line up and at roughly noon, they would start to distribute the boxes and by 1230, the boxes were gone. Um, when I started taking pictures, I could see the, the shame in, in, in people's eyes about being photographed. But I wanted to get out and communicate the fact that people need to distribute, people need to rather, um, I uh, get emotional thinking about this. People, people should be uh, giving money so that donating money and food so that people who don't have enough to eat have it. So I asked a friend to write me a note in Spanish and the, the note said something like, um, I'd like to take your picture so that I can let others know of the need for everyone to help uh, people who don't have enough food. And the result was this. in this. So um, I think I may have mentioned it was kind of hard for us to uh, sometimes get access to places not having, uh, not being press credentialed. So, uh, but I was able to get into a school and I happily discovered there that the kids are so resilient. And even though they had to mask and stay six feet apart and, all that stuff, they were still having great fun. And this photo was taken last Halloween. And now I will give it over to Victor. Hello, can everybody hear me? Uh, my name is Victor Marinchuk, and I am the uh, photographer who resides in New York City. A um, little bit of history. I moved to New York City in uh, 2001, in June, uh, just three months before 9-11. And when 9-11 hit, I uh, felt like I missed an opportunity to photograph the uh, happenings, the uh, tragedy that happened on 9-11. And... Uh, and so when uh, I uh, was coming back from Vietnam in February, right before the pandemic, uh, I was on a cab coming back from the airport, and I got a call from our HR department, and they said, uh, you need to be quarantined because you were in Vietnam and Singapore, and, and we're not sure, you know, what's going to happen, so you need to quarantine for a couple of weeks. So I was quarantined for a couple of weeks. And by the time I got out, I was out for a few days, went to the office and the whole state got locked down. The governor decided to lock down um, New York state uh, because New York was the epicenter at that time of the COVID uh, outbreak. And so I continued to go to the office every day. And uh, I decided this was a moment in time that I needed to photograph. This was another historic event. None of us knew what was going to happen. And so um, I started photographing. So my goal was to start photographing iconic locations in New York City. And this is Rockefeller Center, middle of the day uh, at the ice rink. And there's not a person in sight. Now, uh, that's pretty rare photo because how often could you go to Rockefeller Center in the middle of the day and not see a person? Uh, this is uh, Central Park. This is Bethesda uh, Fountain. 
Um, there's one person out walking his dog. Normally this would be filled with people walking their dogs, exercising, uh, people taking photographs, and yet it's almost totally empty. This is Poet's Walk, and there's one lone jogger. Um, again, this would be full of people on a you know, weekend morning with walking their dogs, jogging, uh, just strolling along, uh, exercising, whatever, and uh, yet it's totally empty. So um, I rode my a bike around New York City, um, which was an easy way to get around. Actually, it was a great time to ride your bike in the city because there, there were no cars on the streets. Uh, there were no people and or just occasionally you would see someone. So I started trying to figure out how I could do something a little more unique, a little more different um, with my photography because you can only take empty spaces uh, you know, so much. And so I'm on the Brooklyn Bridge, I'm looking and I see the reflection in my rear view mirror of my bicycle and I see this lone jogger. So I'm trying to position this image so I can get the jogger without seeing myself or my camera in the, uh, in the mirror. And I got this shot, which I thought was sort of interesting and unique. This is uh, the Oculus, which is the uh, uh, junction of the pass station and the subways. And so normally there would be thousands of people coming through this location on a daily basis as they come in from New Jersey on the path and then transition to the uh, subways in New York. And this was one, one day, there was a couple of security guards and this one lone woman walking her dog. Uh, again, a pretty rare photo to see this. Then I started trying to figure out how I can add humanity to the images. Again, you can only take so many empty spaces. So this was Larry. Larry's a conductor in Grand Central Station. And um, I photographed him. He was walking around. There were a few police officers just making sure that the place was secure. And, um, and uh, again, just empty spaces with a few people wandering around. This was uh, the train platform in Grand Central Station. The train on the left was coming in. The train on the right is about to leave. And I, I really like the leading lines on this particular image uh, because it shows sort of uh, light at the end of the tunnel, maybe. But at this point in time, early in the pandemic, we didn't know what the light at the end of the tunnel was. And, uh, but I just really like this image. And normally this would be full of people coming and going on the platform and yet there's not a single person inside other than the conductor uh, on the train. Uh, there was death everywhere. New York City was the epicenter of the COVID for a um, very long time. And I was in Soho and, and came across this person lying on the sidewalk. And I photographed it initially. I was like sort of upset because that tree was in the way. There was scaffolding and so on. But again, it, was, it captured the moment uh, of what was happening in, in New York City. Um, on May 28th was the day of the first protest that I became aware of about the murder of George Floyd. This was in uh, Union Square, and there were maybe about 50 people who gathered, and there was great anger toward the police. Um, and over a period of time, the crowds grew. This was on Fifth Avenue. Um, there are, you know, maybe hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, this is a protest during a pandemic. Um, and everyone's wearing a mask. I particularly like this image because there's this person wearing these gloves. And this was a period of time when, if you recall, we were all wiping down mail and packages and things like that that we were getting because we did not know how the virus was uh, being transmitted. And so I thought this was sort of an especially interesting photograph. I like the way the hands frame Fifth Avenue. This was on um, about 35th Street, just north of 34th Street, looking south. And the other interesting point was is the variety of ages, uh, ethnicities, 
uh, of the people who are attending these rallies or these protests. Uh, this was in uh, Brooklyn. This was the George Floyd Memorial Service. And the police had estimated that there were probably going to be about 2,000 people. Um, at the end, I think they finally figured out there were over 10,000 people. It was an amazing demonstration, uh, very peaceful, um, but a, an immense crowd. And again, this is all happening during a pandemic. This was the Pride Parade, which had been canceled. Um, and it, it started off very joyful. People, it was an impromptu thing. Uh, people gathered, had fun. They walked from City Hall down to um, uh, Stonewall Inn and then uh, walked over to Washington Square Park. And something happened in Washington Square Park uh, that all of a sudden it erupted in the, to uh, violence. And here you can see the police protecting their own. They were using tear gas. Um, and it just, again, erupted from a very peaceful, joyful um, celebration to instant violence. Just shows you the, the um, tensions and everybody was on a, on a razor's edge. Uh, this woman had been um, I guess got tear gas in her eyes and they're uh, trying to wash the tear gas uh, from her eyes. Um, and again, they were trying to disperse the crowd. Uh, at one point I was standing between the protesters and the police begging the protesters not to attack the police. Uh, the homeless, um, you know, they are the ones that really suffer during the pandemic. Um, if you can imagine being on the streets, which is really um, not a pleasant thought to begin with, but when the streets became vacant during the pandemic, that their sources of income, their sources of food uh, disappeared. There was literally no one on the streets. And uh, this was literally a few blocks from my home. And I just thought this was very uh, poignant photograph with the American flag, this man you know, under the flag and, uh, you know, looking for any help he could get. Um, and one day I was going to the office and I saw over 300 people standing in line at seven o'clock in the morning. And I was going, what are, what are these people doing in the middle of a pandemic standing in line? Um, and so I started taking sort of these stealth photographs. And what I realized was this is St. Francis Church and they have been providing food to the homeless since 1930. And they've only missed a few days during uh, Hurricane Sandy. And so I, I started getting to know the people. Um, the homeless are very suspicious and uh, uh, don't really want uh, people photographing them. You know, they're distrusting, they're uh, just, you know, for whatever reason, they just, they don't want people taking their photographs. Um, and so I got to know them. Uh, I, I actually volunteered um, through an organization who started providing blessing bags. And, um, and so I got to a point where I was able to photograph some of these people. And every morning, seven o'clock, you know, rain, snow, you know, they're standing in line to getting the food. And I thought this was an especially interesting photograph with here it is snowing, these people standing in line in the freezing cold. And this is the only meal they will get all day. Um, this is the, was on the first day that I volunteered to help prepare the food for the homeless. And I call this man the banana man. And uh, he didn't really want me to take his photograph. He's wearing a mask, he's got a cap on, uh, wearing gloves. And so I was gonna photograph him and he lifts these bananas up, but I was able to capture his eye. And um, later on, here we are, months and months later after the book is produced, and he's now dropped his mask, he's got a big smile on his face, and he's so proud to have his photograph in the book. Um, so it went from being uh, 
people not wanting me to photograph them to basically posing for me. And I can go there now and there are a variety of people who still don't want me to photograph them, but there are others who will literally uh, ask me to photograph them, which is, I thought, a very interesting, um, you know, turn of events. Um, the election. This is a photograph taken at Wall Street. And this is, uh, uh, looks like Donald Trump, but it's a man wearing a mask. And I just turned and, and photographed him quickly as he walked by and the texture of the mask and the, the uh, column behind him, I thought was sort of an interesting photograph. Um, again, the same uh, demonstration or get out the vote. Uh, this woman had this incredible veil, this great costume that she had made. And again, it was getting out the vote. Everything, everything I ever went to was very peaceful except for the pride parade. Um, they were very respectful, very, you know, they, they exercised their rights of free speech and so on. But again, it was very peaceful. Uh, election day. This is the first day um, of early voting. And uh, this, the lines were immense in New York City. Um, I don't know what it was like in other cities, but these uh, lines went up and down the streets, the avenues, the alleys. And this was at, at Bellevue Hospital. All the uh, ambulances lined up. This is voting during a pandemic and people were social distancing, they're wearing a mask, and they were waiting in line for hours and hours to, to exercise their right to vote. Um, this was election night, and the city was on edge. Uh, all the streets were, uh, or, or all the stores on the streets were uh, boarded up. They did not know whether there was gonna be violence or what was happening. Um, this just shows the, uh, how divided the country is. You have someone you know, for Trump, somebody against Trump. Uh, but again, it was uh, uh, a really interesting period of time. And then this photograph was the night that they announced or the afternoon that they announced uh, that Biden had won the election. And this was in Washington Square Park. Uh, I was photographing the uh, crowds were just jubilant. And I was actually focused on these two hands, a black and a white hand coming together in unison uh, and in joy. And, and I took this, luckily, and, and interesting, the only face that you can really see in this image is this one woman with her face lit up from the camera light. Mm -hmm. And um, again, it was a lucky shot, but it's... Uh, just indicative of, of the time and the joy that was felt uh, around the country. Um, so now I will turn it over to uh, Susan. Okay, let's see. All right, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm Susan Baggett. I'm the photographer who uh, took the photographs in the Boston area. And I'm very happy to be here and thank, thank you, Sophie and PhotoWorks for uh, inviting us here to talk about 2020 Unmasked. I was actually in New York when the city was locked down on the Thursday, March 12th. I made it back to Boston, thought, ah, you know, I got out of there just in time. And then two days later, the governor of Massachusetts issued a stay at home order and the city emptied out. And for me that lasted five days and I took my camera and I thought, I've got to go see what's going on. So this is the very first image that I took. This is Copley Square. I'm standing in front of uh, John Hancock Tower. This is the Trinity Church. And usually this, you know, the, there'd be people all over the place. And so it was really shocking to me how, first of all, it wasn't an order, it was an advisory, uh, but still people stayed home. Everything was closed except for pharmacies and grocery stores. This is the Copley Plaza Hotel. I'm actually standing in the middle of the street for quite a while actually. And uh, one fellow is 
walking by. Usually this is a pretty busy intersection. This is uh, the public garden, George Washington's statue there. And it's a pretty dismal day, but still it would have normally have been filled with people. I decided to check out the subway. I went to a few of the stations and they were uniformly empty that some of the trains were still running, but really nobody around. I didn't go in, I didn't ride. I just took pictures. This is the Paramount Theater. It's part of Emerson College and usually it's a shopping street, Washington Street. And I, I've always been taught, you know, you find an interesting background and just kind of hang there and maybe something will happen. And eventually this woman came along. I, I uh, took a few of, of her as she walked right towards me, kind of gave me a look and went on. And right up the street, this is a restaurant and like all of them was closed. This was taken um, early June actually and uh, Rather than have just an empty uh, restaurant, they had dressed up all these mannequins. They had them standing around their bar and different uh, tables. And then about a month later, restaurants reopened and they were using them to, uh, to indicate social distancing, occupying every other table. This is a, an antique store that had probably been around for 35 years or so. It's on Beacon Hill, not too far from the State House. And like many stores went out of business. I believe they still have an online presence, but uh, they, they were no longer able to have the, the live <laughs> uh, location. I was by there a couple of weeks ago and no one, pardon? Oh, okay. Uh, it's still empty. They've lost the R and the rent, but uh, no one has been able to take the space. May 31st was the first uh, major protest or, or really any protest that I was aware of um, in Boston. This is again in Copley Plaza. So it was the first protest after the death of George Floyd. The, it was very peaceful. There were a few uh, police officers on bicycles, but um, you know, no people were wearing masks. They were polite, and but there were protests later that day. There was one that went into the evening after dark, and that result that became quite violent. They set police a car on fire, ransacked stores. I really wanted to go out, but uh, our building was locked down. They all, a lot of police lined up outside, tear gas and so forth. I regret not just trying to get out, but I didn't. The next morning I did though, and there was just broken glass, ransacked stores, looted, empty, you know, they've been emptied out all over major, the major uh, Newberry Street where all the designers stores are, department stores. And it was just, um, you know, pretty distressing. The, I think that the issue with the previous night was that they were very understaffed with the police. I don't think they thought anything was going to happen. So within a few days, the National Guard appeared everywhere. Uh, their armored vehicles were in front of, you know, Chanel and Neiman Marcus. And uh, so I was walking along, I saw, I spotted these helmets on this transformer right on the left side of the image. So I walked over, started talking to them and uh, said, is it okay if I take pictures of this, you know, your helmets here? And they, they thought that was, you know, pretty odd. <laughs> but I said, sure, go ahead, you know. So we rearrange them. I said, no, 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 they're good the way they are. So this is the image that resulted from that. And, you know, protests continue. This one is a June, early June. And, but but I, I rarely saw any police officers when streets were shut down or they uh, passed by intersections. It was always people on bikes blocking the cars. Here's another one. This is Tremont Street. 
at the same time. This is on July 4th. In most years, there's, there's a long tradition of um, picnicking and the Boston Pops concert and then fireworks over by uh, to the Charles River and the, the waterfront over there. And people would go, you know, stay the whole day, but that didn't happen this year, it was canceled. And, but fortunately people were available and they, they had several parades, uh, not parades, uh, protests, marches and so forth. And that this guy was, had a lot of personality. On September 23rd, uh, the, the grand jury in Louisville, Kentucky decided not to charge any of the police officers that were involved in the death of Breonna Taylor. The next day, uh, the Massachusetts governor called out about a thousand National Guardsmen, just in case any municipalities needed their help. Um, that, this, this photo was taken on September 25th, the next day, and it was a Friday, and that evening there was a big march, big police presence, but no violence, no arrests. And then over the weekend, there were numerous, there were probably three marches on Saturday, some on Sunday, and the, the National Guard never appeared anywhere, and then there was some light police presence and really no arrests at any of those. October 18th, this is the first time I had ridden the subway and, uh, since before the, before the pandemic started. And I was on my way to Fenway Park. It was the location for one of the uh, early voting for the presidential election. And when I got there, huge crowd, patiently waiting, wrapped around the stadium, masks on, socially distanced, children riding on the sidewalk. And uh, so I stayed there quite a while and then I hurried home. We had one of our two hour meetings with Ari and Robin and Victor. And then after that, I wanted to go back and shoot it at night. And when I got there, there was, there was no line and I was able to go inside and vote. And that was great. And they let me take photographs, just not of people voting, but we were able to go into the stadium after. And um, so that was a really unique experience. This is November 7th, and this is, again, a Copley, Copley uh, Square. And this was going to be a protest that before it started, they had announced that Biden and Harris had won the election. So then it, uh, this is the beginning of it. Uh, this is on Washington Street, not too far from the Paramount Theater. And then that evening, uh, just spontaneous all around the region that the uh, celebrations broke out. A lot of cars honking, people climbing poles. The sign, sex workers for Biden, so on top of the, the, uh, the light pole there. And, but of course the, Protests continue. This is just up the block from the state house. It started out as sort of a pro Trump right in front of the state house, and then counter protesters, and they started marching, and then the police were there. But on a lighter note, life continued on. This is the public garden, weddings, uh, hockey. This was taken uh, in December sort of near the end of our uh, year-long documentation. So that's it for me. I'll turn it over to Ari. <clears throat> Let me share. Hope everybody can hear me. Okay. Hello. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Ari Spy. I'm a photographer from Chile. I've been living in New York for the past 15 years. And right now I'm in Phoenix, I'm a scouting. So <laughs> I'm in a different, um, different city right now. Well, um, thank you, Sophie, for the invitation. Thank you to Photo Walk for the invitation. And I'm very happy to talk a little bit about my role <coughs> in 
um, in, in this process. It was about how we create the book, right? So my role was essentially to be the editor of the, um, the photo editor of the book. And I will be telling you with some samples about some of the decisions behind the pages that you are going to be able to see on the book. I hope you can, um, if you don't have it, you can get it, but um, some yeah. of the decisions behind it. So um, this is our um, 2020 and mass um, cover. So um, let me show you here. This is the team right on the left hand side on top is uh, Robin, then Victor on the right hand side is Daniel, our designer, our great designer, Daniel Hernandez, Susan on the, top, uh, on the bottom left. And <clears throat> I'm there with Lisa Politi, our wizard of Oz, who helped us a lot to, uh, as a consultant. And that's me. We met since May 2020 for a year and a half almost, right? So then my process, my, 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 my role at the moment being the photo editor was to receive all the photographs that the photographers were, were, were creating in each uh, city and each location. And I was taking a look, I was selecting them. And then every uh, Sunday we met for two hours as Robin uh, was saying for a year and a half and during that period, we, I was selecting the photograph. I was seeing what it was working, what it wasn't working, what do we needed more for the book, what we needed less, what subject we needed to focus more and sometimes assign, assign some subject or themes or let's say like we needed some portraits from, from uh, Washington or we needed some, some more a scene of the, of the, of the, of the uh, COVID scenes from Boston. So that was my, my, my over, overview essentially was like, keeping a general eye or keeping a general overview about our subject. Let me remind you that at that moment, our subject was COVID, the pandemic, but suddenly our subjects start to mutate, they start to evolve because we, uh, we, we, we got the horrific murder of George Floyd and then, um, then protests and marches start to erupt all over the US, right? So, um, so then our subject, which was COVID, the pandemic, start to mutate and start to incorporate different things. So, and then election was coming. So everything was happening uh, on the same year. Not was, it, it stopped to being just the pandemic, right? Then become the pandemic, the march, the protest, COVID, the lockdown. So that's how our process evolved during that year. But at some point we had to, we had to say like, okay, we have to put, a limit to our photograph at our project. So we, uh, we established that um, December 31st was going to be the deadline for our, for our project, whatever happened, right? So that was how we established it. And that was a little bit of, of the process of what we're seeing. As you can see here, this is um, Ira Block on the left-hand side, an acclaimed, acclaimed uh, photographer from National Geographic, dear friend of us who went to visit our uh, wall. Imagine this is a wall like probably 20, uh, 25 foot long wall in an office uh, um, in a space office uh, um, that Victor uh, let me use. So I print all the photographs that I selected. Imagine probably I selected from, from the thousand, probably 600. Then I start to create sequence with them. Then I start to create them. Then I start to think about, okay, what is working? What is wasn't working with them? And are these photographs or these subjects are repeating all over too much? So this was for me is an old way to see your photograph, to create sequence and to see what's working, what, how you pair them, right? <clears throat> so he went to visit us and he was um, very, very helpful and supporting with the project. As Robin mentioned at the beginning, he, um, he wrote our final thoughts for the book and for the project. Here, <clears throat> this is an email that I sent to Joe Magnelli uh, Joe Magnelli is a great dear friend and an amazing photographer. Probably you already know them. But at some point, I was a little overwhelmed with so many photographs, with so many subjects, with so many chapters, with so many ideas that I had to create this book. So I said to, I, I, I wrote him and I asked him, like, please, I need some help because I've been categorizing the photographs in three. In, in three um, in three chapters in three folders, but he helped me to see a little bit more. Uh, he helped me to create something um, a different chapter, so I could divide in photo in four chapters the book, and that was very helpful. I was very well overwhelmed with the photograph, and this was uh, 
is always, what I'm trying to say here is always important for when you are overwhelmed or you are seeing your photo app to have a, uh, another pair of, a, pair, a set of eyes looking at your photographs, right? Because it's going to help to create some, um, some different perspective. And that was helpful, very helpful for me and for the project, I would say. So that was the long email that I sent explaining everything. <clears throat> here, um, let, me, let me go back here. These are some of the designs. Okay, when we met with Daniel, with Daniel Hernandez, our graphic designer, uh, we asked her to say, hey, come with an idea of something more, something very kind of like classic and something more edgy. Here you can see both, uh, both ideas uh, being, being paired together. So finally we decide a little bit more classic, but we adopt some pieces of the edges, uh, some edges uh, part of the design also in the classic book. So you can see, has some inspirations for it. Some of the font, some of the, uh, um, the, the numbers, some of the ideas that we're going to use, some of the colors that we decide looking for. This finally is the cover that we love it right away. It has a little bit of texture relief that is very interesting also. This is the, uh, the inside cover. Uh, we use a black and white. Um, version of it, which is a summary, it's a painting, but we decided to use it as a, um, as an inside cover to, to help the book to have something different for it. We use it in black and white It's a summary of uh, everything that it was happening um, during the 2020. And this was a design from Daniel. It was a painting, original painting from Daniel. And we, uh, she generously let us use it as an inside cover. Our book, <clears throat> so, our book is 90% of 95% uh, of pictures that are in black and white. And that was a decision that we took right away at the beginning. We we're going to use black and white to create this book, right? Um, and then, um, and I will tell you why I'm mentioning that. Uh, here you can see, this is one of the design, this is our, our decision behind what, what you are going to see. There was um, a fence in, in Washington DC that I asked Robin to photograph in pieces. She came up with 70 photographs from that, uh, or 78 photographs from, uh, from that fence because it was four blocks long. So um, yeah, I had in my mind that I wanted to create like a, great, uh, like a grid with the photograph. When I thought that, I was like, okay, that could be interesting. But when, when I saw it together, I, I felt that it was like too obvious, right? It's the first thing to, to do. But then I ask uh, Daniel, please, Daniel, let's think about something different, how we can illustrate uh, the fence in a different way with the photographs. And she came up with this idea about the fence. And I think it was great. So, uh, because it was a Black Lives Matter Memorial fence in Washington. And then we used one of the quotes from, uh, from one of the person that was involved in the Black Lives Matter Memorial fence guard. So, uh, from Nadine Saker, as we use it. So, this was the decision behind the creation of the design of this layout. As you can see, these are, these are spread out. So it's one page on the left and one page on the right-hand side. Then this on June 1st, right? Um, uh, Donald Trump took the, um, um, took the to, um, spread or sent the police to, to get rid of a protest that he was having because he wanted to get an opportunity to take a photograph himself with the Bible upside down, right? So this is a recreation of that moment with portraits of people that went over there and, put, uh, and, and Robin took this photograph with the Bible right there. So we, I, I said, okay, let's think about it. And this is a decision that we made with Daniel. We were thinking about how we can emphasize the religiosity about it, being the church, being the process, being the, um, the Bible. And we came up with this idea. So you can see, we create this little grid by creating the cross just to emphasize the, um, the message, right? That's what we are trying to do, emphasize the message in a more creative way. Then here I'm going to show you some pages sample. What you are seeing is the whole spread of the, of the book, like open, right? Left and, so, and, and right hand side pages. So why I wanted to do this, because I wanted to give, um, the viewer the sensation to create the atmosphere, to feel the atmosphere of what it was happening there, to feel the mood of what it was happening there. 
I wanted the photograph to use as, more, as much space on the book as possible so you can really see it and as a viewer really enjoy it. And here you are seeing it in the same spread, right? You are seeing it in color and why in color? We use probably between 10 and 15 photographs in color because uh, when I saw the photograph, when I select this photograph in black and white and then they send me the originals of photograph in raw and I saw the color, I felt that they were going to have much more impact on the book. The photograph was uh, was already uh, it was it was a good photograph, but with the color, I thought there was going to the message was going to be much more impactful. It was going to have much more depth. So this is one of the decisions that uh, why you are going to see on the books some of the photographs in color just to have much more impact uh, on the viewer or on the pages, and also help this as as a way of. Sometimes you are going through the page and you see black and white and you see black and white and sometimes a color boom, it makes you stop. It, have, it makes you uh, to have a pause at some point, right? Let me go back here. My computer is acting a little funky, sorry. So as you can see, this is a portrait of Dustin Foley, right? <clears throat> so what is happening here, we are always trying to figure it out who are the character, who are um, the person, the people that we are telling the story about. So one of the decisions that we make as a team was like, let's involve the people that we are photographing to let them to tell their story. So we asked to each one of them, um, not each one of them, we have um, different people from doctors, uh, nurses, um, teachers, uh, activists, artists, um, many different people that is being portrayed on the book to write testimonials about it because it's not only that we wanted to tell the story visually, but also we wanted them to have a voice on our book at the same time. And you can see this one. This is about the same thing in terms of like uh, the program director or what Victor was telling in New York about the, uh, the bread line in New York. He wrote about what it means and what it is also. Here, another sample of pages. Remember, these are a sample of the pages of the book. I made the decision here because I wanted to have just, <clears throat> as I was saying, I want to give the photograph as much space on the book, right? And I want when you turn around, you, you turn the page around, you can face um, this portrait and you face this person the same way that the photographer was facing at the time um, when, when this photograph was made. Then here, this is a little bit of an idea of how sequence sometimes, how would you pair, or this is a sample of how I'm pairing. I would love to have more time to show you more samples about how to pair photographs sometimes. But at this point, you can see on the left-hand side is one page, on the right-hand side, the other page. On the left-hand side, you have this kind of veil protecting these two people living the daily life, right? And on the right-hand side, kind of the same shape these uh, plastic um, bubbles, right? For the restaurant protecting the people from outside also. So this was a decision to how, how to pair some of the photographs. Then this is a photograph that I wanted to be on its own, alone, just because you can feel and you can be there with this person that is kind of like in this uh, spiritual moment right there. So you can spend a little bit more time there. And then at the same time, if you spend more time, there is a little pause when you are just going through the book. Okay, here is a sample of sequence. Each photograph, each photograph is a, is, a, is a page of the book and this is a sequence. So you can go through them and you go from notorious to the right and go down. So this was like um, a sequence we create to, um, to honor Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? with pictures from, uh, from New York, from Washington and from DC. All of them, they are kind of different but giving you the same message, right? So there was this little part of the book that it was about, uh, about her. And this is how we, we create the sequence. And now these are going to be some of the designs about the, chap uh, about the chapter, how you are going when you go to certain chapter, this is what you see right away. Like here again, you know, this is a spread. And then the next, the one that is on the bottom is the next picture. So 
election, we finally decide for four chapters on the book. We have election, resistance, COVID and lockdown. And we have with the election, we started the book with the election and that was intended because this 2020 for us, or for, I mean, for all of us, right? Uh, it was such a crazy year that, that, we, that it makes sense for us to start with the election. Why not, we said, right? Let's start with some of the energy and let's go back. It was essentially a retrospective of what the year was. So this is the design. You can see the font we selected, uh, some of the information, the picture. Let me put it this way. See, you can see 90% of the book was in black and white, 95% of the book was in black and white, but some of the photograph, they had more power when they was um, on color. And, and that was a decision that, that I made. I consulted with, with the photographers and then we say, okay, why not? It's working, if it works. Look how much impact this has on, on, on top on the COVID chapter, you know, the ambulance. We always felt that, we, all, we probably all saw that, right? And then the lockdown. So those were the four chapters that we ended up having on the book that it was very, um, that was the final decision that we made. And let me, um, and let me brag a little bit, uh, just to mention, as, as Robin mentioned before, we were very honored to get, uh, to, to, to have two honorable mention in documentary and self-published books for the prestigious Lucy Foundation Contest, the International Photography Award, right? And then also I want to mention the, um, the, uh, the three photographers got, were winners of series in the Worldwide Photography Gala Award. So um, uh, using the, the photograph of this project. So I want to mention that just to brag a little bit. And now, please, if you like it and uh, you want more information, you can find um, more information in 2020amassbook.com. I wanted to say that this was a labor of love, not a vanity project. These all the profits of this book are going to a small but mighty nonprofit called Seminar, which helps um, kids to get into a college from our researchers' communities. So uh, thank you so much for your attention. And now to Sophie. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Um, I'm kind of just blown away right now. Um, I've had the chance to go through, you know, each of your photos on my own time. And I, I don't have the book yet, but to witness this presentation tonight um, has just been a, a overwhelming in a emotional way, but also just an important way um, to go through 2020. And I don't know if anyone else relates to that, but I, these past two years, I have very much been in the moment, consuming news in the moment, but not spending a lot of time going backwards and, and you know, staying in the past for too long because it's, it's a lot to take on. Um, but to see your work all together, uh, I think it's just incredibly important. And I'm so lucky that we were all here tonight to witness that. So thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna go to the crowd and and see if there's any questions um, from the crowd. Feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask questions. So if I could, while we're waiting for a question to pop up, um, I just want to say that um, you know this is not an easy book to get through, and uh, we knew it wouldn't be from the start. And for that reason, we provide bookmarks so that you can sit and uh, bookmark where you left off. You know, if my sister said to me, I couldn't get through it in, in one sitting, you know, she had to take it in, in, in chunks. Um, and what we wanted to be, obviously, we wanted to uh, be able to raise money for, for, for Statement Arts. That's you know, first and foremost in our hearts, but 
what we want this to be also is um, a book that'll stay in families for generations to come. Um, you know, this book very likely will have far more importance um, 10 years from now when people are looking back and realizing what we all had been through. Um, hopefully it'll be behind us by then, <laughs> right? But uh, anyway, I just wanted to give that little bit of information. Could you speak more about um, where the funds will be going to for your book? Sure. Ari, do you want to talk about that? Um, okay. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, well, Steminar is a nonprofit that my wife founded like 17, 20 years ago, right? It's a, um, it's a nonprofit that has been creating opportunities for kids that are under researched communities um to go to college so they um they take them they through a summer program they teach them um arts and i and i mean music writing acting right and also um love skill supporting skill you know because they they come from from um places sometimes that they don't have that family that is there behind them so uh, seminar become their family, right? And through that love and support, they um, they help to go through process um, of going to school, going to college. You know that idea that they never thought that they were going to be able to do. Seminar provide them. So essentially, that's I mean, in in, in short terms, that was something one of the things that seminar does. So it looks like we do have what two questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is from Don Hester. Beautiful presentation. What you did to photograph this all, have you all sought out counseling? <laughs> um, which is <laughs> a good question. I mean, Victor, I was even thinking of the, the body that you saw on the street. Um, you all witnessed pretty horrific things. So yeah, can you speak a bit more to that and, and how you were able to cope with it? So can you repeat the question? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, the question was, what did you do to photograph this all? Have you all sought counseling? Oh, uh, I, I think our uh, weekly sessions were actually therapy for all of us. You know, we, we truly did meet for a year and a half every, every weekend on Sunday. And I think, you know, that in itself was therapy. It, it, you know, I didn't realize it until, all right, so we, we were originally going to end the project in July, as Ari said, and then because of the events uh, that occurred, we continued on till the end of the year. And um, so we, we basically stopped photographing for the book on December 31st, 2020. And I think probably three or four weeks after that deadline or that date is when I really realized the whole process was therapy for me. Um, the, the meeting, we continued to meet, but um, it gave us a goal. Um, uh, it, it kept us, our minds occupied, not on um, the events that were happening, you know, that were so tragic, but it gave us a project, a goal, uh, something to look forward to. And so that was our therapy, I think. Yeah, I don't know if y'all agree with that or not. Yeah, so. I do. 100%, yes. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, you know, I look forward to those Sunday meetings. Uh, just so look forward to them. Um, as and, and this was something that, um, you know, going out and, and trying to find great photographs and having that as a mission um, was something that I think it really kind of saved me. I don't know how people got through the pandemic without having something to do. Uh, in terms of the impact and what we were seeing out in the streets, um, I kind of went on autopilot and I would go out there and I would see a lot of things as we all did. And we'd see some terrible things. And I, I didn't really 
I put it away. I put it in a box <laughs> way back in my brain. And then when it came, when we were working on the book toward the end and we had to, we decided we were gonna provide an index and we had to go through each of our fo own photos and, and document what, when they were taken and where they were taken. I remember doing that list and I just, I totally broke down, um, totally broke down crying. I was realizing just how much um, I had seen and taken photographs of during the course of that time. And it was, it was overwhelming, but it was good. <laughs> it was good that I broke down because I needed to do that. I needed to feel all that emotion. One other comment, I, you know, I think that um, the whole process challenged us individually to be better photographers. You know, I would, you know, our weekly sessions, we would see, oh, look what Susan got. Oh, damn, I didn't, you know, I, I need to step up my game or, or what Robin got. And, I, you know, there were several projects like Robin's project about the, um, the, the Bible in front of the church. You know, I thought that was just a brilliant, um, you know, segment into itself or project into itself. And, and it was like, wow, that was so fantastic. And so it, it helped me, uh, stimulated me to, you know, try to be a better photographer. And there was sort of a, I wouldn't say a competition, but it was like, you know, I've got to do better to keep up with everybody else. So yeah. it was a sense of pushing. <laughs> yeah. But I think also we didn't we didn't want to let everybody else down. You know, you think, oh well, I just sliding through, you know, you have to hold up your your responsibility to the, you know, to the project and to representing where you are. Um, and I think also there were, there were things that aren't my strong suit that I was encouraged to do by the others, you know, talk to people, <laughs> you know, ask them to say what they were feeling. So, so I think, and, you know, we were really a support system for each other. And it was, and these are people that we, we all, we, we knew each other for a long period of time. And so it, you know, it, it gave us a chance to, to continue that where we normally would be seeing them in person, we were just seeing them on the screen, but it was also, you know, three other faces besides my husband's, you know, <laughs> so it's great to be there with him, but it was nice to have other people enter my, my little apartment. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would say, let me just add a little thing. I would say that the camera become a, became an instrument for the photographers and for us that I was involved in the project to understand what it was happening around us, you know, and being finally a being witness, uh, firsthand witness of, of what it become an historic event, a year like no other. Yeah, we would talk about also, we, we had to keep up with what was going on around us. So we would, um, you know, I'd hear that there was something going on in Washington and ask, you know, Susan and Victor, is this also happening in, you know, in your cities so that you could capture that there? I mean, it was, um, you're constantly trying to stay ahead. There was so much, so much going on. Um, there is work behind it, you know, there is research. You have to learn from the people, you have to learn from the searchers, you have to go to the searchers to ask what is going on. It's not that you just walk around and see what's happening, no. You have to invest time to research what is going on around you in your city in these cases. You know? yep. I think oh, also yeah. listen, listen for helicopters because <laughs> that's where they were going to be. You know, so you yeah. just multiple uh, multiple protests during the summer occurring every weekend or even during the week. So it's like, ah, oh, I hear a helicopter. I got to go. Bye. I'm skipping dinner. I'm going to go see what's going on. So yeah, the the other thing that you know that is we didn't really touch on we we did slightly but all this occurred during a pandemic and you're we're in the middle of massive crowds you know and we don't know how this stuff is being spread at the time and so we were uh you know wearing double mask goggles um you know in the no. middle of the crowds because yeah. we had no idea what was going on and you know um I actually got hit in the back of the head during that 
that pride parade with a water bottle you know when it erupted you know it just went to hell in a has basket in just a matter of seconds and things were flying and and uh you know but we're in the middle of all this massive crowds like the the george floyd memorial in brooklyn you know there are ten thousand people there ari's in the middle of it uh i fortunately was able to get up on sort of a higher elevation so i could capture the the immense crowd that was there um but i you know again trying to navigate the crowds um and not get too close but you know try to photograph and document what was happening during this period of of the covid um so it was a real trick and it was a real risk and we took the risk not knowing how it would turn out so yeah, there are times I came home and I thought, this is it. I, I have COVID. There's no question. <laughs> I was right. We never it, did. You know? None of us, none of us got it. So but none of us got it. You know? Yeah. Um, really, uh, yeah. Um, we have another question in the chat um, from Karen. The photos and story are so poignant. Can you bring it to public schools as part of our history? We would love to do that. Um, we've been trying to um, we've been trying to approach uh, photojournalism schools and uh, do presentations. We've done a few, um, but also getting the book into libraries. And um, I haven't quite cracked or started to look into the public school route. I don't know these days with, uh, you know, hear about all sorts of books being banned. So um, that could, could yeah. be a problem, but uh, it would be wonderful if, um, if we can somehow get this into libraries and we, we still have to pursue that very vigorously. If anybody has any inns in any libraries, all right, we're already in the Library of Congress. That's fabulous, but wouldn't it be great to get it into yeah. um, more public People. libraries? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, one of the things that um, we've discovered, and we, we actually actively look, and others are looking, and, and the fact that this book is unique. Uh, there are books that capture maybe the protest or the election or parts of it, but we have not found a book that captures the entire year, all the events that happened, and then again, the books that do touch on the subject they're generally one photographer and not three so they're usually in one city and not three cities and so from that standpoint the book is very unique mm -hmm. um so yeah, i might want to expand upon that but it, it is a unique project i think yeah but also having the people who we photograph tell their stories and right. and and um with their narratives which are fascinating i thought um yeah we, we try to involve as many voices as possible on the book right not only ours but uh, as many possible so um, i think that's also part of the uh, of the unique man the uniqueness of the of the book how has it been in the aftermath of self-publishing this book and you're over the frenzy of, of um, not completely over your printing again, but what are kind of your next steps and what is what has it been like um, since having it published? But I would say that for all of us, it was like a, a master, a PhD of how to do it, you know, we not, not either of us has uh, any um, any knowledge about how to do it. And we had to learn it from the, how do you say it? From, I mean, from the beginning, I mean, everything. Right. Like, yeah. Like creating a LLC society, no, a non-profit society for the, for the book. Then go to printers, speak with printers, uh, with printers, sorry. Uh, choosing paper, what paper work, which one was, and what is going to be better for the book. I mean, and, and then all the things that we had to do for the book about shipment and, we decided actually to do it. Um, we decided to print it here in US because at some point we heard that 
outside of China could be much cheaper for us, but there was no certainty about when we would be getting the book. And a lot of friends, they did print or publish some book, but they got very, very delayed on the, um, when, when they were going to receive it. But it, we are still in the process in terms of learning what else to do. <laughs> I would say we know some of the stuff, but we are still learning what to do. Yeah, so we're in the phase now where we're learning more about marketing, um, wanting to keep the book going, and um, and that's not as fun as going out and taking pictures. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, you know, it's I it's mean, important. We also, yeah, we also want to keep keep down the expenses. You know, sort of. We don't want to hire an expensive marketing person because we want to be able to give the money to statement arts so it's we we're trying to be frugal but still you know make progress in terms of spreading the word mm -hmm. yeah. one of the questions that people ask me about well when is the sequel coming <laughs> the, the next book and i and i don't i i speak for myself not the others but you know, what I learned is, is that, you know, this, this is a tremendous amount of work and that I think one book is, is all I'm good for. So. <laughs> has it affected, um, or has, has your personal practice as an artist changed mm. since this past year together? Wow. Yes. Uh, for me, I felt like, um, because we would present our photos each week to Ari and have Ari is a fantastic photographer in his own right, also an amazing teacher and mentor and um, having him review your photographs um, in a really honest and raw way, it's like, it, it fabulous learning experience just fabulous it was like all right i had those ten thousand photographs in my life already down but now i'm getting feedback <laughs> and um it was it was really great i don't i know my process my thinking when i have that camera in hand i know it's completely different now And as far as what's next, we're all going to Barcelona because our we have some images that are being presented at a gallery there. The Photo Nostrum is part of the Pollux Award that Ari mentioned. So, so we'll all meet in Barcelona. Anybody want to come? We'll see you there. Wow. <laughs> Sign me up. Hopefully <laughs> Barcelona. <laughs> Just... Well, hopefully, yeah. Hopefully we don't right. have any other waves of, of things and they don't shut things down but that's the plan now yeah. it's going to be over we're going to be there so so we i think we'd really love to you know, do more of these presentations um certainly to do eventually to do something live and in person would would be great um we have many more photos that we can uh tell stories behind and about uh so if anybody has any knowledge of any corporations, schools, anything that you think would be interested in hearing us talk, uh, we're, we'd really love to hear about it. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, this has been a wonderful evening and we're getting right at 8.30 p.m. Uh, but thank you for everyone in the audience, everyone who came out tonight. Um, go out and buy that <laughs> yeah. book. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> for a good cause for a good cause yes we're not making any money off of this it's all going to statement arts so there and if you'd like to um read more about these photographers here you can go on to our website at glen echo photo works and we have a page dedicated to them and of course you can also um go onto their own websites and onto the 2020 unmasked website and and buy the book so thank you everybody thank okay. you photoworks thank you sophie yeah. everybody yeah, thank you so much thank for you for hosting thank you everybody this. for right. attending this presentation thank you right. thank you bye bye, bye.
Oh, we got some nice, nice notes. Yeah. Thank you, Sophie. Of course. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Sophie. So should we get you a copy of the book? I would love that. I would love to, to buy one myself, actually. Oh. <laughs> um, what a great, great night. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, again, I, um, I hadn't, I, I don't know, to have such a comprehensive view of 2020 is amazing. And I, you know, I can only imagine what it's like to have the book literally in your hands. So yeah, I'm, I'm just so grateful you reached out to me and I'm, I'm really glad we could make this happen. Thank you. All right, we'll make sure you get a book in hand. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, well, stay well. Good night. Good night.